Hey guys, it's me, Emil, and today's video is on electron wave behavior. Hmm. So to talk about electrons and their wave behavior, we should ask, what do we know about electrons already? So let's have a quick look and remind ourselves about things we already know about electrons. First of all, we know them to be negatively charged, small, high-speed particles found outside the nucleus of an atom. We also know that they occupy certain locations which we call orbitals or shells, and those locations have different energies associated with them, and they're different distances from the nuclei. We also know that electrons and their sharing or their gain or their loss are the basis of bonding. Okay, so if electrons are gained and lost, we call that ionic bonding, and if they're being shared reluctantly, uh, we call that covalent bonding. We also know that electrons are the basis of all the chemical properties and uh, certainly because the chemical properties come from bonding and bonding behavior. So the electrons give us bonding, which give us properties. We know that electrons are attracted to protons. And of course, here we have Coulomb's law of electrostatic attraction, which is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the items in question, in this case, an electron and a proton, and R is the distance between their centers of charge. So K is our constant for Faraday, or Coulomb's law here, and uh, Q1 and Q2 are the charges, and R is the distance between the centers of charge. If this force comes out positively, like you have two negatively charged objects or two positively charged objects, then that will be a repulsive force. And if the force comes out negatively, like one force has an opposite sign either, that'll be an attractive force. We also know that electrons are difficult to localize. Consider that they're very tiny and they're moving very, very fast, so it's hard to pin down where they are, and we'll come back to this uh, soon. We also know that a flow of electrons we call current. We also know that electrons, are, we kind of consider them to occupy the vast majority of the volume of an atom. So most of an atom is full of emptiness and electrons, and really just a tiny bit of nucleus down in the middle there. Electrons have spin, and that is to say they, um, because they have what we call spin, they have these magnetic uh, fields due to their rotation, or their analog of rotation in any case. Electrons display both uh, particle and wave characteristics, and that is just a very uh, dense statement on its own, but leaving it for now, let's ask a question uh, that students do ask regularly, and that is, why don't the electrons just go park themselves on the nucleus? Uh, they are negative, the nucleus is positive, wouldn't it be easier and simpler? electrons to just go sit there. So to answer this one, we need to meet an influential uh, 20th century uh, particle physicist. And uh, this gentleman name was Werner Heisenberg. And uh, that's him here. And uh, in 19, about 25, he formulated an astonishing idea about subatomic particles, which we now call the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And uh, his, his principle is really quite groundbreaking, but in any case, it, it looks like this. He says that the uncertainty that we have in the momentum of a particle multiplied by the uncertainty that we have in the location of that same particle, the product of those two uncertainties should be uh, no less than some constant value. So the uncertainty in the momentum of a particle multiplied by the uncertainty in the location of a particle multiplied together would be uh, no less than some constant. And if you think about that one for just a second, you get the astonishing conclusion that we can never know both the position, that is the location, and the velocity, because the momentum has a velocity of any particle perfectly. If we know perfectly where it is, we can't know its velocity, and uh, conversely, that's true. And the question we have is, well, why? And that is because the electron location and momentum are both changed by photons. So if we want to sense an electron, we have to detect a photon that bounced off of an electron or was otherwise affected by it. And uh, consequently, uh, that will change the electron's position or momentum. So the electrons can't go sit on the nucleus because if they did, then both their location and momentum would be perfectly known. That is, they'd be on the nucleus, not moving. And that's not allowed by Heisenberg's principle. And consequently, uh, we consider this to be impossible. Uh, that's worth thinking about for just a minute before we go on to wave behavior. As I commented earlier, electrons have both wave and particle characteristics. And really, because of this, they resemble nothing in the large world where we live. Don't feel too badly if you are not able to come up with a good intuitive understanding for the behavior of electrons. That shouldn't surprise you because electrons behave no way 
like anything that you have an intuitive understanding of. For a hydrogen atom, for example, here we see that at energy level one, there are possibly only two electrons and uh, they can only be a certain distance away. They are shown by the dashed line from the nucleus. If you want to get three electrons on there, we have these three wavelengths and you would get the three electrons out of this next distance. And we can actually predict where these locations are around the nuclei. And the idea that electrons can only occupy locations so that whole numbers of wavelengths close on themselves. So electrons really seem to obey this kind of wave behavior. Well, if we want to understand anything about the wave behavior of electrons, so we need to look at waves. So then let's go and look at waves. We'll do a short study of waves here. And I think it's worthwhile to look at here a wave with a wavelength, the lambda, the lambda, that length is given in meters. Um, that point is moving forward with a velocity uh, in meters per second. We'll call that velocity V. The height of the wave away from its uh, zero amplitude location here we'll call the amplitude. And uh, if you are standing at one location and uh, watching the waves go by, they have a frequency F. It's the number of waves that you would see going by any given point per second. And so the frequency is, is one over second, some quantity of one over seconds, which is called Hertz. Now, if you have a look at all this, you'll quickly see the velocity of the wave should be equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And we'll just check the units here and see that it is true. This thing is called the universal wave equation. Now, of course, if we're talking about electromagnetic radiation, then the velocity is equal to the speed of light c and we get c is equal to f lambda where c is 3 by 10 to the 8 meter per second that's the speed of light f the frequency and lambda the wavelength there's one more famous physicist uh, that i want to mention quickly here and that is max planck and uh, he had this idea that photons have energy that's proportional to their frequency it turns out it's um, interestingly proportional to their frequency and uh, that statement there looks like proportionality constant h, Planck's constant 6.63 by 10 to minus 34 joule seconds. So here where the energy will be in uh, for one photon in joules, f the frequency will be in hertz of so one uh, wavelength per second, and h, uh, Planck's constant. We can also substitute from the above c is equal to f lambda and make f is equal to c over lambda from that one. And if you put that in there, we get the energy of a photon as hc over lambda. And it's very convenient if we measure the wavelength of that photon. And since wavelength is color, it's a lot easier to measure wavelength than it is to measure frequencies. The energy here will be hc over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength, and we're calling it equal to color. So the idea here is that photons of different color have different energy. Let's have a look at the uh, photon emission spectrum for helium, and you can see there's a couple of photons coming with blue and purple, one red, one green, and so on. So we'll get into a little bit more about the electrons uh, next time. Do stay tuned for why and how uh, this works. Have fun, thanks, and stay tuned. Do have a look at the next two videos in this playlist for more on the topic, and watch video number 32, Electron Orbital Configurations. This is my dad's YouTube channel. It's awesome. So like, comment, and subscribe.